All right, we're in video 14C. Going to pick up right where Joe Cooperson left off with the Cecil College smoking example. We were assuming that 20% of students smoke, um, but we have a hunch that um, more than 20% of students smoke at Cecil. Um, so we'd like to model the sample proportion with a normal model. Um, Joe just got done finding the mean and standard deviation of that model, so let's review this from the last video. Remember, we use the symbol mu with the subscript of p to say this is the mean of the sample proportions. That's the population proportion, which is 20% or 0 0.20. The standard deviation of those sample proportions is the square root of p times 1 minus p over your sample size. And so again, he just did this. You can fill in um, 0.2 here, and our sample size was 100. And recall, we got 0 0.04. So the sample proportions, we're expecting them to be centered at 20% with a standard deviation of about 4%. Um, so you can sort of visualize what that will look like. Um, we'll actually draw this a little later on. OK. Let's go the next one. Is this one okay? Get a new marker maybe. But for the next one. Oh, perfect. Okay. You, you should have these from the last one. Yeah. But now we'll see it, make sure the next one's darker. All right, number two, or next thing. Uh, <coughs> we, we said in the last video that there needed to be some assumptions that had to be checked. So let's go through the assumptions. Uh, we just assumed they were met. They were met, but let's go through them. The assumptions that have to hold, and you should always check these, so these are conditions that you should check um, to make sure that you can use the normal model for a sample proportion problem. First off, we are looking, we are working with categorical variables. The percentage of students that smoke, um, if we took the whole class and wrote down, here's Susie, here's Joe, here's John, here's Alketa, um, and we could have a column that said smoker, and you would be a yes or a no. Right? So that variable, are you a smoker, is a categorical variable. So when we're looking at sample proportions, we'll always be looking at variables that are categorical. Um, in a future problem, perhaps we look at the percentage um, that are of, some, of people that are female, or the percentage of people that um, drive a truck. Um, and so both of those are more examples of variables that are categorical. So the variable of interest has to be categorical. That's our first condition. The second condition um, is the randomization condition. We should attempt to have a simple random sample. That's not always feasible. Um, so realistically, that can be difficult. You at least want to be confident that your sample is not biased. Um, certainly wouldn't be fair to go outside to a, a smoking area and take a sample of students from a smoking area. Um, we clearly have some bias in that sample. So attempt for a simple random sample, but at least make sure your sample's not biased. All right, condition three. Is the sample size condition. We want to make sure that our sample size is not more than 10% of the population size. Um, there are a couple of ways to check this. We want to make sure our sample size is less than 10% um, of the population. So we could make sure our sample size is less than 10% as a decimal times the population size. Um, the other thing, the other way you could check this is if you knew the size of your population. Um, you know, if you solve this for population size, you could make sure that your population is greater than your sample size divided by 10%. Um, here you're sort of checking, is my sample size um, not too big? Here you're checking to make sure, is my population big enough? population um, big enough for this size sample. We'll check this in a 
second for the smoking problem, but do know that in future problems, once in a while, um, you won't be able to outright check this. We'll just make sure this is reasonable. Um, if I had a problem and the population was everybody that lives in the United States, and I take a sample um, of a thousand Americans or a thousand people that live in the United States, um, I might not know the exact population of the United States, but I, it's reasonable to assume that a thousand is certainly less than 10% of that population. All right, condition four is the success failure condition. And so for our normal model to be accurate, you need to expect to have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. Um, in the smoking example, that means that in our sample, we need to be able to expect to have at least 10 smokers and at least 10 non-smokers. Um, and so in general, the way we'll check this, we'll take our sample size times that population proportion, and that needs to be at least 10. We need to be expecting at least 10 successes. And we also need to be expecting at least 10 failures. So we can take, again, our sample size times the likelihood that you don't smoke or the likelihood of a failure. And that needs to be at least 10. Um, so here we should be expecting at least 10 failures. And again, we'll check that in a second for the smoking problem, but that condition um, was also met. All right, those are the four conditions. Let me say a few things, more things about those conditions. So top of the next page. Why do we need to check conditions to use the normal model um, for the sample proportion? So let's go through them one more time. We are modeling a sample proportion that requires our data to be categorical. Um, in statistics, we're going to model the sample mean uh, or, I'm sorry, not yet, but further on after we get finished with proportions, we'll, we'll um, model the sample mean. The techniques will be slightly different. Um, and so you always do want to think about what kind of variable you're working with. With proportion problems, we have to have a categorical variable. When we get to sample mean problems, we'll have a quantitative variable. Um, so just make sure that the variable you're working with is categorical. Um, in this case, you're a smoker or you're not a smoker, that variable um, is categorical. And again, we'll use different methods depending on the type of variable, so that's why that one's important. Okay, the second condition again. Um, ideally, our data should be generated from a true simple random sample, um, but the real world often gets in the way of data collection. Um, so if your data are biased, and let's say that perhaps um, for Cecil, for the Cecil smoking example, we only sampled night students, um, or this one I find humorous, or we smell tested students' clothes, um, or who knows um, what we did there. We went out to a smoker circle and, and you know, gathered our, our 100 students from there. That wouldn't be fair. We probably wouldn't have much faith in our results. Um, so make a plan, have a sound plan for how you're gonna collect your data. Um, and you should do it in a way so you get a fair representative sample without bias. Um, hopefully you see that some of these other methods here would certainly have potential to contain some bias. Um, so when possible, get a true simple random sample. If not possible, at least make sure that you collect your sample um, in a non-biased way. If we collect biased data, all of our results aren't going to mean anything. All right, condition three. The sample size must not get too large when compared with the population size. Um, if it does, we might run into problems with the data values being independent of each other. Um, the statistics methods that we're going to use to perform inference always require that every data value is independent of the others. And so if our sample size gets too large, that um, assumption of independence could be violated. Um, so to check for that independence, we're going to make sure that our sample size um, is not too large so that that assumption is not violated. All right, fourth one was about the success-failure condition. We need to expect at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures for our categorical variable. 
if you think back to lesson 14b with Joe Cooper Sannon where he drew the sort of didn't really do a dot plot but he drew that number line and he put the p hat values where they might be um, you know that was for simulated data actually there was one in the notes for doing it multiple times um, we have to expect at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. Um, if we don't expect at least 10 and 10, then our data will end up not having that nice unimodal and symmetric shape like you saw when we simulated um, that uh, selecting pop a population, I think, like a thousand times. So in other words, the normal model will be a bad fit, and we want to use the normal model. Um, and so in order to use the normal model, we have to make sure our data look unimodal and symmetric, and that will happen if you have at least 10 successes and 10 failures. All right, we've gone through the four assumptions here, the four conditions a couple of times. Let's now verify these for the Cecil College smoking example. Um, so first off, whether you smoke or not, smoking or non-smoking, that's a categorical variable. That's good. When we're working with sample proportions, we need categorical variables. Um, the second assumption was that we have a random sample or at least one that's unbiased. Um, so the way we selected our 100 students was unbiased. We got a random sample here. conditions hold. Um, the third condition was that our sample size has to be less than 10% of the population. Our sample size was 100. Um, if you, um, our, our population size is around 2,500 Cecil students. If you took 10% of 2,500, that would be 250. And our sample size is certainly less than that. Um, so our sample size is less than 10% um, of the population. You know, in this case, 100 was definitely less than 10% of a population of roughly 2,500, that would be. 250, and our sample size was smaller than that. All right, the fourth condition, um, the success-failure condition. I'm going to erase this and put that one up. If you need to, you can pause to copy this. But the fourth condition... <coughs> In our sample of 100, we need to expect to have at least 10 smokers and at least 10 non-smokers. Um, since the population proportion is 20%, if we took 20% of the 100 students, we'd be expecting to have 20 smokers. We'd be expecting to have the other 80 as non-smokers. Um, so for ours, we're expecting 20 smokers. That's more than 10. If we're expecting 20 smokers, then the other 80 we would expect to be non-smokers. So again, this condition is met. And so we feel pretty confident here that the shape of the sample proportions will be unimodal and symmetric there. 
So both of those have to exceed 10. All right, we've gone through the conditions that have to hold, those four conditions. Now let's see what we're going to do next. All right, so for this smoking example, um, draw a sampling draw a sampling distribution model for the sample proportion. Remember, we're going to assume that we have 20% smokers until we have data that convinces us, of, us otherwise. And we're going to refer back to that 68%, 99.7% um, rule and draw a picture of this. Alright, normal model, draw a nice bell curve. Right in the middle here, I'm expecting this curve to be centered right around 20%, if that's the percentage of smokers. Now at the beginning of the video and at the end of the last lesson, um, recall that we computed the standard deviation. So I'll write off to the side here. The mean was that 20%. The standard deviation for sample proportions was about 4%. I can use that and draw where we would be one, two, and three standard deviations above the mean, and then um, fill in this empirical rule here. So one standard deviation above the mean, we have a sample proportion of 24%, 24% smokers. Two standard deviations above, we'd be at 28. Three standard deviations above, we'd be at 32%, and we'll do the same thing the other direction. said 68% of the time we would expect to get sample proportion values between 16% and 24%. So if at CECL, if it's really true that 20% of CECL students smoke, about 68% of the time we took a sample, we'd expect to get a sample proportion somewhere between 16% and 24%. That should happen fairly frequently. 95% of the time we'd expect to get sample proportions between 12% and 28%. And then 99.7% of the time, we'd expect to get sample proportions between 8% and 32%. Okay, so you may sort of have an idea where we're going with this based on what happened when we actually um, took some samples. So um, this is what the sampling distribution model would look like for the sample proportion for this one. Let's do some more things with this. So I'll go on to question A. If at Cecil College, our one and only sample was like that very first scoop we took with 30% smokers, what should you conclude about Cecil College students and their smoking habits? Um, so I'll leave this up here for a second. Look where that would fall. If nationwide the percentage is 20%, we take one sample of CECL students. In our sample, it's 30% smokers. Look where that falls. That's out here, right? That's somewhere between two and three standard deviations higher um, than the mean. Okay. Not going to be out there all that often, right? Most of the time we're within two standard deviations. Now we're a bit beyond two. Although, not way out here with three, but seems like that would be a bit unusual. Um, so what would we conclude? We'd conclude that, a couple of things we might conclude. Either this 20% value, there's something fishy with that, or we ended up with a sample that's just a rather unusual sample. And that could happen, um, but we start to kind of doubt. We sort of had a hunch that this... Um, proportion at the college was actually higher than 20%. I think we have some evidence for that given that 30% is more than two standard deviations above the mean. So let me say a few things over here. Our sample proportion here of 30% is um, more than two standard deviations. Uh, 
higher than the mean. It would be unusual to get a sample like that um, if the 20% value is correct. we move beyond two standard deviations away from the mean, that's getting to be unusual. Um, so we could get a sample like that, but that seems like a very unusual sample to get if the true population um, average there is 20%, if the true percentage of smokers at the college is 20%. All right, let's keep investigating that a little bit further here. So B, what if we convert that sample proportion of 30% to a z-score? I already better have a pretty reasonable idea, and you might even be able to just look at this and figure out what it would be. That z-score is better be, this is a z-score of zero, right? A z-score of one. Here I'm two standard deviations above the mean. Here I'm three. It better be somewhere between one, or I'm sorry, two and three, right? You might even look at that and see it's exactly two and a half. But let's compute that. So recall a z-score, you take that data value, see how far away it is from the mean, and then we want to talk about that in terms of standard deviation. So we divide by the standard deviation. Our sample proportion value was 30%. The mean was 20%. And I'm writing these in their decimal form. And the standard deviation as a decimal was 0 0.04. <coughs> and if you compute that, you'll get a z-score of 2.5. So our sample proportion value, our p-hat value of 0 0.30, was two and a half standard deviations um, above the assumed proportion of 20%. So, um, that's unusual. That's not going to happen very often. unusual result here. So further evidence that I'm not so sure about the 20% value at Cecil. Uh, let's do one more thing here to convince us of this, part C. What if we use the normal calculator on StatCrunch? Go under Stat Calculators Normal again and determine the probability of getting a sample of size 100 where you have 30% um, or even more than 30% in your sample that are smokers. So let's draw a picture. When you go to that calculator, you'll have a picture here. You will put in the mean is 0 0.20, there's a box for you to fill in the standard deviation, is 0 0.04. We're interested in getting a sample where, let me draw this a little more accurately, that was two and a half standard deviations above, where we get 30% or even more in the sample that are smokers. <coughs> um, and we're looking for what's the probability, find that probability. So I'd like to find the probability here on the stat calculator that x is greater than or equal to 0.30. It's actually a 
this value out here. So if you were to do that, I trust that you remember how to do this, you'll get about 0 0.0062. So think about what that means. That's a pretty small probability. If our initial assumption that at the college 20% of students smoke, if that's really a valid um, assumption there, the likelihood of getting a sample where 30% or even more than 30% of the students smoke is 0 0.0062. 0.62% chance, not even a 1% chance. If you were to take sample after sample after sample, not even one of them out of 100 um, would result in a sample where 30% or more um, were smokers. So if you haven't been convinced yet, I'm convinced. I hope we've convinced you now. Um, but it seems like at the college, this probably isn't true. It seems like our hunch that this is probably a bit higher um, seems more valid. If we moved this whole distribution over a little bit, we could make it so that getting a sample with 30% smokers was a lot more likely to occur. Um, so let me just write a sentence summarizing this and that'll wrap this up. So if the model's correct for Cecil College, and by correct, I mean, you know, if it we really do have 20% um, that smoke. We draw a sample with 30% um, of the students that are smokers or higher with a likelihood of only 0.62%. Um, I had to put my money on one of those, I would say our initial model was not correct for CECL students. I would guess that the percentage of smokers at CECL must be higher than 20% given the likelihood of the sample that we got. All right, that's finally it for this lesson. Thanks for watching.